In a market where differentiation absolutely matters, do marketing, communications and PR agencies struggle sometimes to truly be different? Hello, welcome to Fuse from PRCA. My name's Dan Gold. Fazana will be with us in our next episode. On today's episode, we are joined by two remarkable guests who have been shaping the landscape of food, drink, and hospitality PR. I am excited to introduce Emily and Liam Keogh, the co-founders of the award-winning PR agency, Palm. With their expertise and innovative approach, Emily and Liam have carved a niche in the industry, driving success for their clients while nurturing a vibrant work culture. Emily, Liam, thank you so much for joining us here on Fuse today. Thank you so much for having us, Dan. It's really great to be here. Yeah, thank you very much for having us. I think we should hasten to add, because we do have the same surname, that we are actually brother and sister and not any other <laughs> form of relation or partnership. Uh, we're certainly not husband and wife, which some people might see or think when they see our names on paper. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're delighted to be joining together on this today. This brother and sister combo, it's it's fascinating to me going in to work together you're right so many agencies are husband and wife and that's a common misconception that absolutely could happen and I'm sure you've experienced it many many times but you come to this with different expertise I mean Emily has come from this uh, creative strategist side um, with the travel and hospitality food and drink Um, and then Liam um, 20 plus years um, leading the strategy side or strategic side for industry giants. And um, I'm I'm just really intrigued to see this space. And we'll talk about the agency in just a second. But this space between you, where is there that sibling mm, complementary relationship? And where is that professional line where you both have quite different specialities, but complementing each other? I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, I think one thing to say on this is that we have had Palm for 13 years and we started the agency when we were both relatively young. So I was 26 and Liam was actually only 22. Um, So, you know, most of our kind of adult working life, we've been working together. And I think that makes a real kind of difference. Um, I think people always are kind of shocked that we can work together as brother and sister. Um, And I'm I'm sure Liam has a lot to add on this, but I think the key learning that we've taken over the years is to to divide and conquer and not try and do the same thing. And I think in PR, especially when you're starting out, you have to wear so many hats, but over the years, you really kind of work out what bits really fit, you know, your personality type. So as you mentioned, I do more of the creative strategy and Liam's amazing at the kind of operational um, kind of agency um, framework um, and planning kind of side. And then when we don't cross over on those bits, it goes swimmingly well. (laughs) Yeah, I think, you know, our our kind of secret of success is to basically have as little to do with each other as possible. (laughs) You know, uh, Emily said, you know, we've got we've got different skill sets but actually we're very very similar in personality type um so it works really really well we have our own spheres of influence we have the our own areas that we're responsible for and i think that works on a personal level in terms of how we operate together but from a business point of view it's very very efficient because actually we're both capable of doing stuff at a very very high level and if we end up doubling up it doesn't actually add any value as emily says dividing and conquering is our way of um, getting the most out of each of our productivity. And for a long, long time, we were kind of working together in tandem, working across similar things all the time. And I would say it probably wasn't until that point where we diverged our responsibilities um, that we were able to really, really grow the agency. And I think the added advantage of that is it makes the working relationship better. I think we have like all of the benefits of, running a business with your sibling without any of the downsides because of that. And I think the the best one that you can, the best thing that you can get from working with a sister or a brother is you just have that incredible level of trust 
and that incredible level of understanding of what the other person wants, where the other person wants to take the business. And we just work incredibly well together because we're pretty much in sync on on everything. So a lot of the time we don't even need to really ask the other person their opinion because we're pretty certain of the way to, they would like to proceed with things. Was there a time that you literally from beginning of day to end of day would be constantly in contact? And did you get to the point of going, actually, the healthy gap and letting us specialise in our own spaces really matters? Because, look, I love my sister and I hope that my sister's watching this. I love you, Penny. But, um, you know, could we be in the same airspace constantly? Absolutely not as much as I love and respect her. But yeah, was there a point where you consciously or unconsciously put that space in to let each other breathe? I mean, most of our working relationship, apart from, you know, post COVID when it's hybrid working, we have been every day together in the office, you know, um, that that has never been a problem. It's been more about, as we said, the decision making. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, it sounds terrible. It sounds really corny, but I'm perfectly happy to hang out with Liam all day long. Um, and as Liam said, I think the the thing about um, being in a business partnership with a sibling is that you really understand that person's moral compass um, and you know that even the kind of minutiae decisions that you're both making, we're both guided by the same kind of North Star kind of, you know, value wise and everything else. Um, So, yeah, I, I think the one thing is we don't really hang out outside of work. That's where we probably draw a line because, you know, we, then we just end up talking about work anyway. So, um, yeah, we're quite happy all day long at work. And then after work finishes, we kind of go off and do our separate things. <laughs> yeah, I think I think <laughs> we are in constant contact. I think we like that. And I think, to be honest, if you run a business, obviously there are points where it's incredibly stressful because, you know, you're having to grapple with issues. Um, and you need someone that you can just have a sounding board with. So we're constantly talking to the other person to get opinions and second thoughts um, on the different way to proceed with things. Um, I think, you know, we will often ring each other just to talk at the end of the day if we've not spoken to each other all day. And sometimes we will say, don't worry, I'm not ringing you about work. I just want to talk about... <laughs> yeah, because we pick up the phone. Yeah. Um, but no, I think I think that side of it has never been the issue. I think we diverged because we realized there was a real business case for it. And then when we diverged, we thought, oh, actually, we should have done that a long time ago. Because not only has it been better for the business, but also we can then each of us achieve more individually with that support of the other person in the background. Mm. And I think, you know, we actually have like the relationship that Liam and I have, which is really open and kind of really frank and everything else. We have actually got that with our senior leadership team um you know we do kind of monthly breakfast with them and stuff and I'd say you know it's exactly the same um which is really nice I think we kind of inculcate that through the team it's not us and them which I know you know sometimes it can be especially if you've got two co-founders you know we're not in a kind of ivory tower making decisions it's very collaborative and um and that's kind of part of the fun of it because you know building relationships with humans is obviously as PRs is what we love, but, you know, with your own team, it's it's the best. Has there ever been a moment where being a sibling has been an advantage? There are times in the office where it's got late for one person or another and you think normally, oh, I won't message them because it's too late. But being a sibling, it's like midnight, half past midnight, like, it, it's fine because they're my sibling. And have you ever had to have that conversation to go, actually, let you know, it was just a bit too late for me because we do take we do take liberties when it's someone who's a member of the family. Yeah, I mean, I guess, again, going back to it, you know, as we started the business so young, we probably don't know really kind of any different. And it has been our life since our early 20s. Um, having said that, we're both, we might start work quite early um, when things are super busy, but we are both good at switching off at the weekend. And, you know, neither of us would ever be working at midnight, you know. Um, so um, 
I think that we're both pretty good at that. Um, but but yeah, we certainly, over the years, it, it's just really fantastic to have that person you can ring up and you can be like, I have totally mucked up here. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I've made this mistake. And you can just say it in an environment where there are, the only the only consequence is going to be that you're going to get help. Um, and I guess that's not necessarily normal when you're at a very senior level. Uh, I, I don't know. We, we've not experienced the alternative. But um, yeah, it happens all the time. You know, we might be saying, I'm really struggling with this thing. Can you help me? Or, or whatever it is. It's very, it's very, very valuable. It's very, very valuable. And to be honest, I always say this, but I, I cannot fathom how someone would either run an agency on their own or run an agency with someone they didn't have that level of compatibility and trust with. And I think a sibling is almost uniquely placed over other relationships. Obviously, if it's a romantic partner, there's there's issues with that. Um, A parent and child dynamic is a bit of an unusual dynamic as well. A sibling or a very, very close cousin, I would say is probably the best person for you to have a, a business partnership with. What were the, you know, the early days of like, hey, I think we should do this and we're good together. And this is the type of organization that I slash we would like to build. Because from that first conversation, was it just organically, yes, this is great. Was there any, you know, pause in there about the relationship or was it just like, hey, I'm in and can we go into how that steered what Palm is? Mm. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So I had started off at Ogilvy on the consumer PR team there, um, which was headed up by Kerry Milliken at the time. Um, I then worked at Mischief um, under um, Mitch while he was kind of um, driving the agency to the engine sale. So an incredibly intense time. Um, And I... During this period, obviously working across consumer PR, wearing millions of different hats as you do, you know, doing everything from kind of Sheila's Wheels car insurance to Quaker Oats to gaming, you know, whatever else you're kind of thrown um, into. Um, I kind of realized that the whole time, all I was doing in my spare time was looking at hospitality and travel kind of new openings um, researching kind of food and drink brands. And I had this moment where I thought, why aren't I just doing PR in these sectors? So I moved to a very small hospitality um, agency and I noticed that the hospitality agency market at that time wasn't really applying the kind of considered structure um, as, you know, the big bigger kind of consumer agencies were so I had this idea why not bring together that kind of big agency strategic work and and structure um and kind of measurability and accountability um and but but do it in those sectors and I think Liam you at the time you were actually working in hospitality and journalism weren't you yeah, I mean, I, I left school and got a job as a journalist straight away when I was 18. And I did that for about five years. And then I ran nightclubs for a long time as well. So I kind of came to PR, not having really done PR, but also having done PR, um, but n- not in any way experienced. And I think in terms of the development of the agency, I think coming coming from a point of like huge naivety has been, in my opinion, our greatest strength. I think very early on, we we did a very good job of managing the client campaigns. I think we were really good at that from a very, very early point in the camp- in the, the life of the agency. But what we certainly didn't know was how to run an agency and how to create a culture. And I think because our early years, we were disastrous in that way, we've learned so much. And now everything that we've built has been through trial and error. So I feel very confident in talking about the good systems that we've built now, the great culture that we've built. But all of that, I think, has been created from a point of not necessarily understanding how to do it in the beginning and having to learn through mistakes. So the the, the, the culture we've got at the moment has been perfected 
um, through years of trial and error. And I'd say it's not really until the last like seven years that we really, really nailed it because one, we were, we were inexperienced in that department. Um, but two, we were also very, very young. Um, and we've matured and our experience has grown. So I think in a way, starting at a very young age has been really advantageous because it's we, we approached everything with zero prejudice because we didn't have a set way of doing things. So everything that we've been, we have created has been based on our understanding and our experience of what genuinely works and what genuinely doesn't work. So we basically perfected a system through that process that's been very, very effective. On the client servicing side, I don't think we've had any real challenges. We were always really, really good at that. And we were able to win business really, really early on. And it kind of, it kind of just took off. Very, very yeah. Quickly. So Liam, Liam essentially was kind of, you know, doing those things, and I started off, and it just it's kind of rocketed so fast. We won so many clients so quickly that you know Liam kind of came. I think you're living in Le- in Leeds or Manchester. Came down and started working full time mm-hmm. on it. Um, but as Liam said, I think one of the things that I think, you know, maybe made us kind of a bit slower to evolve, but actually has been a real benefit is that we weren't, we weren't taking methods from other agencies and just kind of using, you know, cookie cutter kind of approach. We were actually thinking about it and engaging with it. And we weren't really trying to emulate a certain other agency. We've just always done, you know, what we feel worked. Um, and we've worked with so many really innovative startups. We've worked directly with the founders. I think one of our, you know, one of the things that I'm personally passionate about is, you know, we're real experts in the industries that we operate in and, and specialists in that. And, you know, we've had so much one-on-one time with incredible founders that have done so many exciting things. And we've been part of that team. Uh, because we were a small agency that's what happens they pull you in you know on everything I mean thinking about what we were just talking about with Liam and I having work boundaries the the place probably where there's been the least boundaries is when we were a young agency and the clients used to just be you know calling us around the clock and we were so excited about it you know we would we'd always be there doing things and it was an amazing learning curve obviously hugely over servicing and and not the right move you know when we grew but um, in those early days, it was it was a great way of kind of really immersing ourselves in the landscape. So from the lessons that you learned from those early days, you've already touched on it. You've spoken specifically about systems and building your own way of doing things. So I'm really intrigued to see um, how your systems evolved as your agency grew, as you added people to your organizations and you learned lessons of, okay, this is the direction and you must have had an element of pivoting, like we're going to try this, try this, try this. Um, How did you then get to the point of introducing that element of entrepreneurism that we've spoken about previously into empowering your employees? Because that is something that you you often hear an organization goes, you know, run this like it's your own business, but you've systemized this and really empowered people. Yeah, I think that the biggest lesson that we we learn at the outset of our company over the years is that like culture is the number one priority we have in the agency. And we will always prioritize our team over our clients. And I mean, it's such a cliche, but we, we really, really fundamentally believe that. Um, one, it's kind of the decent thing to do to be really great employers. But the other point is from a business point of view, if the team are really well nurtured, they're motivated, they're engaged, they're well remunerated, then the client work will take care of itself. And like, we fundamentally believe that. So we kind of have like four principles that shape the culture in the agency. Um, the first one is that we want everyone to have the benefits that they would have if they owned the agency themselves. And those benefits are primarily that you have more control over what you earn. Um, You have a better financial incentive. um, And also you have that sense of autonomy and self-determination. So when it comes to pay, well, I'll talk about that a bit in a moment, but like 
we do literally everything we can to pay people as much as we can. So we have loads of different bonus systems. We have loads of different commission systems, all all aligned with performance. Um, we are employee owned. So we have an employee ownership model. People two years into their life at the agency, they'll get shares in the company. Um, and then the other thing is we try and create a culture where people can determine the outcome of the work themselves. So what we mean by that is, First of all, like we do not believe philosophically in micromanagement, like our fundamental belief is that the more independence people have, the better job they have, the better job, sorry, they will do. If they have like a very senior member of the team breathing down their neck, attending every client meeting, overseeing every bit of work they'll do, they'll they'll step back themselves and they won't put forward their full potential. Um, we have a very, very flexible working model at the agency and like we really believe in flexible working model again it's a philosophical point like we don't i think some companies post covid think well we've got to do it because everyone will walk and they do it through gritted teeth they don't really think it works they'd much rather everyone in the office five days a week we do not have that opinion we believe that flexible working has a benefit for the company and for the employees and it just works much better than that um and then when it comes to self-determination we try and create an environment where people can actually determine what type of clients they work on. Um, we have a separate new business team and they can essentially work into that new business team and say, right, I want to represent more of these types of brands. Maybe, for example, they have a particular passion for sustainability or British businesses or whatever it is, and they might want to build a portfolio of that. Everything that we do is we try and give people choice and self-determination because our fundamental belief is that if they have that then they will be way more engaged in the role and and they'll they'll do a better job so that's one making sure that they have all the advantages that they would have if they um own the agency themselves um the other thing is progression like we are obsessed with progression at the agency and what we mean by that is we have created an environment where people can progress at the speed they want. I mean, some people do not want to progress at light speed, um, and that's absolutely fine. Interestingly, most people in the PR world really, really want to progress. And I look after recruitment and pretty much every single person I interview, first question, why are you looking for a new job? Why are you leaving your current agency? They all say to me, there wasn't enough progression at the last place. Mm. So I think that's a key point. You know, we over the last 13 years, almost every single interview we heard that why are you leaving don't feel there's any career progression don't feel there's any career progression so that is a real driver for why we started you know the system that I think Liam's just going to talk through now yeah so I think the way it's easiest to explain by thinking of it as growing from the bottom up rather than the top down. Um, we have what I would call like a grassroots approach to growth I think normally in an agency that isn't like a mega sized agency, like the founders, they're out, they're winning new business and they're filtering it down and they're growing it that way. What we do is we allow each individual team to grow themselves based on how they want to grow. And we have something we call salary targeting at the agency. So in addition to unlocking commission and bonuses, if you grow your team, you'll also unlock a higher salary as well. I think in most jobs, not just PR, but in most jobs, you work very hard, you slog your guts out. And at the end of the process, you turn around to your boss and you say, well, look, come on, I deserve a pay rise. I've been working really hard. And then at that point, there's there's a fork in the road as to whether you get it or not, right? And nine times out of 10, your boss will have to make a decision on the financial situation of the business, which the employee will know nothing about. So what we do at the agency, first of all, we give everyone complete transparency on the financials within their team. We have something we call radical transparency. So they know exactly how much money each of their clients are bringing in. They know how much money it costs to run their team. Um, and therefore, from that, they know if they want to increase their salary, what needs to change on their personal financials. So we start the process with them by saying, right, imagine you're on 30K, 40K, 50K, whatever it is, depending on the level, tell us what you want to be on next. And they might say, well, I want to be on 35 next or 45 or 55. And we say, okay, to get from A to B, this is what you have to do. So pay rises historically are retrospective. Our pay rises are targeted in advance. Everyone knows exactly what they're working towards. They know that they'll get it if they hit their their um, their goals. And, and crucially, they have complete awareness over the financials. So they don't ask for things that they know aren't possible. Oh, we need an extra member of the team or I want a pay rise when I can't get it. It's, it's just all laid bare to them. 
And then, and then the final thing on culture, we just really, really try and make it a nice place to work. I think we've been very good at creating an environment where people start at a certain time, they finish at a certain time, they take their lunch break, they're not working super late into the evening. Yes, of course, it happens all the time. But I think the difference is that we really, really trying to make sure it's, you know, nine till six. Um, I think the, the fundamental point there is we we believe that people work best if they just work their set hours. We don't believe that working really late produces more productivity. So we're not aiming for that, uh, whereas I think some organizations do. So um, culture, I think, is, is, is the kind of the fundamental foundation to absolutely everything we do. And we put so much energy into perfecting it it's not perfect like we do not think it's perfect if you spoke to our team i'm sure they'll be able to pull out stuff that they say you know this doesn't work so well the, i suppose the difference it's is always an evolution though like yeah, you're not, and, and you're, we're never going to get like, to perfection um but it's always a journey it's like anything yeah and i think the point from where we're coming from is we will always just try and make it better like we always see it as unfinished business as a work in progress and we're always trying to trying to change it and improve it wouldn't it be fair to say the agency that believes or any organization believes that they are perfect are the ones that are truly blind to the problems that they've actually got? Yeah, I, I think. And it's just, you know, you think you're perfect, you'll be complacent. And if you're complacent, yeah. then you run into trouble, certainly. Um, I think I think we've, we've done a lot to improve our culture and make it better, but it's totally a work in progress. And I could probably think of a hundred things that I'd like to change and make better. Um, and we will just continually work on it and, it has to evolve as well with what what the uh, the employee landscape looks like as well because people want different things now than the employees 10 years ago and obviously we've been in business nearly 14 years so we know a lot about how employees have changed in terms of what they need to find fulfillment right well this brings me on to a really important space because of in in that time that you've been doing this and you've been um employee forwards let's say uh You've seen how society has changed, how, you know, practitioners have changed, how thinking and innovation has changed. And during all of this, we've had technology and platforms which have, in fairness, influenced that and, and maybe accelerated that as well. What are the expectations of the people that you worked with a decade ago compared to now? And I think more importantly as a question – um what do you what have you had to change in your approach as and I'm not going to get into the millennial x z you know issues and certainly nowhere uh beyond there uh, but how have you had to adapt in how you engage with people as time has gone on hmm. that's a really interesting one I mean I guess obviously there's been a lot there is so much more talked about now and so much more awareness you know from kind of the generation that even just coming into the workforce about work-life balance um it wasn't really so much talked about when I started out um and I think that's kind of only a good thing um obviously now you know we are a hybrid work model um and that is really really important to the younger generation um that has it, it's interesting you know the effects that that has um we are really pro hybrid working as Liam said but you need to be very conscious as an employer about hybrid working especially for those who are starting out in PR because you don't get every single day the spontaneous you know, um, listening into kind of conversations or hearing your uh, the kind of senior team on the phones pitching to journalists and all of the stuff that you kind of happens by osmosis of being in an office and kind of understanding, you know, office culture, you know, how to dress, all of this kind of thing. So, you know, we, we're very aware of that and it's about how you maximise the time in the office Um when you're together and not make any presumptions about how people that are new to PR might view things or operate. You know, we all know that kind of the Gen Z generation and obviously, you know, the generation under them coming up, they are consuming media in such a different way to say myself or Liam, you know, um, 
they're getting a lot of their news from places like TikTok, you know, short, um, short burst news um, areas. And, and, you know, again, it's, it's almost teaching people to sit down and read a whole article when they're very new to PR. Um, I think that is something that's going to continue. Um, obviously, we have to adapt our PR campaigns to all the changing media landscape, which we're all, always doing. But I think there's definitely a generational shift there. Um, I was sitting on the tube with my eight-year-old son and opened up the Evening Standard. And he just said, wow, there are so many words on that page. That would take you ages to read. And I was like, no, it wouldn't. So I think there's a big generational shift between the way media is consumed um, that obviously, you know, we need to be very aware about as employers um, and need to adapt PR campaigns um, accordingly. Yeah, I think it's it's an interesting question. I think um, there, there is a lot of negative talk about Gen Z, not just in our industry, but in the, the sort of wider working world. Um, I think people are kind of showing their age really when they start criticizing Gen Z. Um, I think a lot of it is mythology. We've actually got loads of Gen Z um, people working in the agency and our experience of them is they are completely hassle-free to work with and incredibly hardworking. I think the big change that has happened in not not just 10 years, I think a bigger time frame, right? Mm. I think people perhaps initially just saw their job as a way to get a paycheck at the end of the month and I think now on a much larger scale the majority of people are seeking other forms of, of fulfillment through through work and I think that's making companies look at the business differently and look at how they operate differently with their employees and I think that's not necessarily a bad thing it's a bit like when you have a challenging client they can be annoying but actually they they improve your processes. Um, and I think it's kind of the same. If we have younger people come into the agency and they hold the business to account in different ways, um, then it's a good opportunity for us to improve. Mm. In, There's in so ways. many learnings that we have, you know, working with, you know, we, we have people in the agency that are literally, you know, 21, whatever. Obviously we do work experience placements, internships as well. Um, and there is such a big learning there, just in terms of understanding the headspace. And obviously, we need to adapt our output as an agency for our client work to that, um, because that is the generation we're talking to a lot of the time. Um, and I think Liam and I are really conscious of that, because, you know, we did start out when we were really young and we were always the young ones. And now, you know, we're learning from the new, the younger generation and, I think that finding purpose is really, really important. Um, and that kind of, try, we try to feed that through our culture as well. Purpose, value, um, alignment, authenticity. I hate to use the authenticity word because I think it's one of the most abused words in the English language. But um, what I've what I've certainly seen from, and I'm listening to you, right? I'm sat here. I don't know if someone's on the underground with their, you know, earbuds in and listening to this. I'm now 46 and I'm like, I was, I was the young one. And it's like, okay, what's my responsibility to the people coming in? How can I help them on their journey without also indoctrinating them into my ways because are my ways any better than theirs whilst you know professionally there are things that need to be done I need to learn from others I've always had this need to learn from others whether it's people of different cultures backgrounds um, ethnicities etc it's always intrigued me to go, okay, well, how does your lived experience really inform the decisions you make? And does that whole um, approach add value to our collective um, space on the planet? Ignoring the whole work thing, are we stronger together? And the answer is always. It's always yes. And that space, that opportunity to look at, you know, am I stuck in the past I'm not going to leech off of people but am I stuck in my ways are there different ways to do this so I'm always intrigued to look at 
different ways of thinking. I, I was just going to say, and I actually think, I don't know if you agree with this, Liam, but I would say actually since the pandemic and all the disruption that happened there to ways of working and everything, I would say now we're so much more flexible and open-minded in our approach than ever before, you know, and yeah. um, I agree, you know, it's curiosity that keeps you young. Um, and yeah, we, we need to remain open, open-minded to, you know, different opinions and ways of working for sure. What I get from you is not just that these are the things that we feel are right. And these are not only the things that we feel are good for our people and therefore the clients as a result. But I, I feel that you've kind of got this next step piece. Is, is there another piece beyond um, the PR, just the work itself, where you want to bring change, where you want to make a difference, where you want to help things is there a piece like that around yeah 100 percent um i think and again you know don't want to sound kind of cliched but you know we are a family business and we do really think of our employees like our family we want to treat them in the right way and support them and we're very close to them you know personally um as well and in terms of our sector you know we work we represent so many purpose-led businesses businesses with a kind of bigger mission um and that's really important to align ourselves with um and and select the type of businesses that we work with and that we can be proud to um to represent and get behind um and that you know to use your you know phrase authentic that we can authentically promote you know, and, and, you know, with, with a clear conscience kind of, you know, pick up the phone to media and really believe in them. Um, and I think that for me is really, really important. Do you ever get people coming into your organization, uh, whether they're at the, the, at the student level or, or just into first days of being a practitioner where the sense is, you know, media relations is a bit old hat and actually we could just communicate directly with audiences, cutting out that section. Or do people come in realising quite early on that there's that balancing act? I think they understand there's definitely a balancing act. Um, but I think... Um, I think the difference is, I guess, is that with platforms like TikTok and Instagram, the young the younger generation are creating their own content on there all the time. So they feel that there's a level of knowledge around those platforms that they're bringing to the table already because they're interacting with them, you know, as a consumer, but also as, um, as a creator, however small that might be. And so I guess the world of media still is, feels more, kind of mystical in a way and you know because they're not the, the journalists aren't generally as kind of visible they don't know who they're talking to whereas you know you can pitch an idea to a TikTok creator and feel like you really know them because you followed them for years and you know they're sort of showcasing their kind of personal you know there's not that boundary so I think that's the difference um but yeah we don't get people coming in and sort of poo-pooing at traditional media it's more that I feel that they have you know they're coming to the table with some knowledge of the other platforms as I said from both the of their own creation and the um the consumer level looking at values looking at trust and transparency looking at your beliefs and those of the people whom you choose to work with and those who work with you um can you just tell me a little bit about the trading standards petition and what was behind that and how that came about basically we saw a story in the times um that said trading standards was moving to uh ban the use of dairy related terms for non dairy products. So for example, someone might have a plant based milk, and they might describe it as a milk on their packaging with a Y. Okay, that's been terminology that has been in use for years and years and years. Um, and trading standards is now t made made the decision that they want to they want to outlaw it. Now, you know, we we took issue with this for a number of reasons. One, um, 
lots of these companies that are using this type of terminology are really, really small. Um, and the cost of changing all of their packaging and all the rest of it would be ruinous in some in some regards. The other thing is that trading standards claim to be doing this because it was creating consumer confusion, which we don't believe is a real thing. And, and no one in the industry believes is a real thing. No one is picking up a carton of nut milk and assuming that a cow has produced it and coming back and complaining to Sainsbury's and asking for a refund. It just doesn't exist. Um, the other thing is they're applying it to some sectors, but not to others. Great example is peanut butter. Trading standards is not turning around and saying, we've got to change the term to peanut butter because it's not got dairy products in it. So it felt a very strange thing to do because it felt like it was targeting one particular sector. As a business, we represent all types of um, companies within the food and drink industry. And we felt that this was kind of an unfair targeting of a, of a particular industry, one that actually we've worked with a lot. Um, and and the, the final point is that when you innovate in an industry, then you do new things that pe- people aren't familiar with. You, you coin new terms like milk with a Y that people aren't um, familiar with. So you've got to push the boundaries. And we're of the view that trading standards and the British economy is, in general needs to be very open to innovation, disruption, new things. That's how it retains its dynamism. That how it re- that's how it retains its growth. It felt mon- monopolistic. It felt unfair. It felt like it was trying to dampen down the free market capabilities of the food and drink industry. Um, And we saw this article in the Times. We saw that no one was really saying anything about it. So we said, well, why don't we create a petition, get together all of the food and drink brands that we are connected with, whether they're a client of ours or not a client of ours. And we're supported by people who are clients and not clients. And basically do a media campaign to say, hang on a minute, this isn't right. Let's get a petition going to get trading standards to change their mind. I think they've got until like September or something to finalize what they're thinking. And we hope that this, in addition to all the backroom lobbying that's happening from the kind of the bigger companies, is going to shift shift the um, shift the outcome of it. But it just didn't sit right with some of the values that we have and our experience of the industry. Yeah. And fundamentally, it's trying to address a consumer problem that doesn't even exist. Yeah. So like, what's the point? Really? From a comms perspective, you know, we think that everyone should have an equal playing field. You know, we can't have certain categories that can cling on to certain terms. Um and actually, it was very interesting because off the back of this, I mean, I think we've got around 7,000 plus signatures, um, which is really positive. But off the back of this, we've had kind of people getting in touch and citing, you know, the earliest known cookbook, which talks about nut milks. So, you know, there, there's also like a historic uh, kind of food historian argument that actually these aren't even new terms. Um, so it's, it's a really, really interesting one. Um, and, you know, as, as I said, from a comms perspective, we, we're, we're agnostic in terms of the sector. It's just that we think everyone should have equal rights. And this is particularly the plant-based sector is a really innovative and growing sector. We've got loads of independent British brands that have really done some very interesting things led by very passionate founders. Um, we don't want to see that dampened down at all. With that in mind, you've highlighted that this was a story that came from you know the times and there are many sources to be interacting with uh, of of news and opinion and social media and the tiktoks and everything like that um when it comes to you as individuals when it comes to um books that you've read that have either inspired or you know, unlocked that next special level when it comes to public relations. Is there a book that either of you rely on or is there has been there been a podcast or a blog that you, you know, religiously read where you go, actually, you know, these are different ways of thinking? Or is it that reading sources outside of the industry is where inspiration can come from? Uh, Emily, I'll start with you on that one. I mean, you can see my part of my bookshelf behind me I'm a voracious reader and I always have been um my kind of main role in the agency is kind of creative strategy so um I'm a big believer in reading outside of sectors um I read 
everything um you know biographies fiction you know interesting kind of you know history stuff um literally every genre you can think of um of course I kind of avidly read you know titles like PR week and things like that but actually um I'm a really big believer in reading around things um because I find that I get so much creative inspiration um from different genres that aren't just even just food and drink and travel and hospitality um and I and I also that's something that we really try and inculcate to the team at Palm we have a kind of book um budget for people to go and buy books and it doesn't have to be in our sector so yeah I can't give you a a specific PR based one but I would say read around everything yeah I mean we we are big believers in like reading because I think if you read a lot you become a better better writer and good writing is such an integral skill in the world of PR um I think one one I mean I listen to tons of podcasts some of them are just like completely <laughs> unrelated to the world of PR one that I I do listen to religiously is a podcast um called Pod Save America and it's ostensibly about politics over in America but really it it focuses primarily on the kind of campaigning tactics that the Democrat party and the Republican party um, are implementing to kind of win public opinion or win particular campaigns. So it, it's a political it's a political podcast, but actually it's really about really really good PR. And invariably, because he's such a big character on the scene in American pod, uh, in American politics, it, it's always talking about Trump. And you know, unfortunately for all of us, Donald Trump is a absolute genius when it comes to public relations. And it's fascinating to hear about the tactics and the. Um, the different campaigns that go on over in America. I mean, my opinion is that, you know, looking at the ways other industries do really, really good PR, really, really good campaigning is always a great source of inspiration. Obviously, it's completely outside of our sectors of food and drink and hospitality and travel, but the the stuff that they do is incredibly inspiring. And actually, this this petition campaign that we've just done is is almost like a political cause driven type of campaign as well, um, which you know may or may not have been inspired from stuff that we encountered from from further reading. So I mean, it is always it is. I think it is almost more valuable in a way to read and listen to media outside of the sector you exist in, um, because you live and breathe your sector. You probably have a really good understanding of it already. Yeah, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I also think that Crooked Media have put to get who are the people yes. behind Pod Save are just mm. brilliant in the way that they think of of framing things and positioning the question, and then the success that they've had in rolling this out into multiple productions mm. because the the format is so flexible in asking the question why, which is. Yeah, it's something that always scratches the itch for me. Okay, as we get to the end of today's episode, I have a question for each of you. And it's along that those lines of, you know, the people that you interact with when it comes to the onboarding, when it comes to those who are, you know, cold approaching you. Um, Liam, if I could start with you, one piece of advice for for young PRs trying to get that foothold in the industry. That's 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 a challenging question because there's quite a lot of different things you you could say on it. I think I think it's really valuable for people to kind of understand exactly what PR is. I think PR is one of those interesting industries where I think the perception of it because it's obviously uh, depicted in certain ways in the media, which is not necessarily accurate. The perception of it um, is not necessarily in line with what the reality is. So I think one thing that people need to understand about PR is it's incredibly rewarding and fulfilling, but it's also incredible, incredible hard work. Um, and I think making sure that you are committed to the world of client servicing, public relations, agency culture before you enter it um, is really, really valuable because that's very, very obvious if you're interviewing. Um, I think what you want to do is you want to have a really good handle on the media landscape, whether that's traditional media, whether that's social media, whether that's influencer marketing, um, because I think for someone at a, a, a junior position in an agency, so much of their... Um, 
so much of what they're being judged on is how they understand the media landscape. And even if they've been in a scenario where they've never spoken to a journalist before um, or ever reached out to an influencer, if they can come to an interview and say, right, I'm interviewing for a place at Palm. I know you guys specialize in food and drink. And this is my understanding of who the movers and shakers are in the world of food and drink. That is a massive advantage. Um, I think if someone's entering a job for the first time and at the very, very start of their career, my advice to them, which is something I did when I was very young and it really, really worked, is just to say yes to absolutely everything. I think what employers value the most for for a new person entering their organization is reliability. You, you, if you're reliable, then you don't necessarily have to be massively talented. You, if you're talented and reliable, that's fantastic. Um, but reliability is incredibly important, um, but also just an incredible can-do attitude. The people who have come into the agency who have started life as an intern and you've turned around to them and you said, can you do this random job that might not necessarily be appealing, but do you mind doing it because we need someone to do it? And they have responded with enthusiasm, um, positivity, and they do that with everything that they've been set. Those are the people that you just hang on to because you think, well, they're a pleasure to work with. Um, and I think talent, of course, is really, really important. Capability is really, really important. But personality is such a decision maker when it comes to hiring people, especially in smaller agencies. Mm. That's exactly what I was going to say. So very succinct, like be prepared to muck in on anything. Um, and, you know, likewise, I remember my very first job was an intern at a News International publication. Um, and I just, I just made the tea constantly and got the editor's lunch. And I just, you know, I, I did it seriously. And I kind of, I wouldn't even have considered, you know, that it wasn't a great job. Um, and I got noticed by the editor immediately and got offered something and kind of leapfrogged other people. And that was not conscious at all. But now as an employer, you know, as Liam said, the superstars are the ones that do everything with grace and do it efficiently and with a smile on their face. And they're the people that are real gems that you end up working with for years and years and years and, and go up and progress, you know, at light speed. Well, our time is up for today. I'd love people to have the opportunity to connect with you directly. How could they do that? Um, yes, you can find us on Instagram at Palm Public Relations. Um, if you'd like to email myself or Liam directly, it's just our first name. So Emily or Liam at palm-pr.com and we will get back to you personally. A big thank you to Emily and Liam for contributing to this episode of Fuse. You've got all the contact information of how to get in touch with them. And if you'd like to find out more about Fuse from PRCA, simply visit prca.org.uk forward slash Fuse. And you'll find not only audio episodes, but video episodes linked there as well. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. And please do share this with colleagues and friends. 